Okay, so hi everyone and thanks so much for joining today um, for live from the studio with Ali Ahadi and Babako Kar of the Ali Baba Conundrum for the presentation, What is it to be Ali Baba? So I'm just gonna share my screen quickly once again. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Griffin Art Projects is situated on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the tsleil Squamish, Musqueam and Stolo Nations, and we are honored and grateful to undertake our work here. So my name is Jazz Keeler, and I'm the Contract Virtual um, Programs Curator at Griffin Art Projects, and I have just a few very quick housekeeping notes before we jump right into today's presentation. So first, I wanted to mention that if you would like to see live captions displayed for today's presentation, you can enable this by selecting the CC live transcription button at the bottom of your screen. And I always just mention that it's not super accurate in particular for names, but we do hope that it's helpful in capturing most of what we are saying today. I also wanted to mention that we are live streaming today's event on Griffin Art Project's Facebook page, and I'll just go ahead and paste the link into the chat. Um, so if for whatever reason you're experiencing any issues with the Zoom interface, you can also follow along on the Facebook page. Um, so lastly, I just wanted to mention that we are using Zoom's webinar format today, and that just means that we cannot see or hear audience members, but we do invite you to get in touch with us using the chat dialog box. Um, feel free to say hello. We'd love to hear where you're joining us from today. Um, and I'll also mention that there will be time for audience questions at the very end of today's presentation. But if at any point throughout the presentation, a question pops into your head, feel free to go ahead and type it in the Q&A dialog box, which is actually separate from the chat. And that's where we'll be checking for the question and answer session at the end. I'll also mention that there will be the opportunity to ask your question out loud. Um, and you can indicate that that's your preference just by raising that yellow virtual hand at the bottom of your screen. But I do always just mention that today's presentation is recorded. So if you do ask your question out loud, um, your voice will just be captured on the audio recording. Okay, so that's it for all my housekeeping notes today. And I'm really super happy to introduce Griffin's current artists in residence, Ali Ahadi and Baba Gokar of the Ali Baba Conundrum. Uh, and I'm just gonna spotlight um, Ali and Babak alongside me as I introduce them. Um, okay, so Babak Gokar um, was born in 1977 in Berkeley, and he spent his formative years in Tehran before moving to Vancouver in 1996. He obtained a BFA in visual arts from Emily Carr University of Art and Design in 2003 and an MFA from the University of British Columbia in 2006. And Golkar has been researching diverse subjects, refining a particular conceptual vocabulary, ex and exhibiting works both locally and internationally. So select exhibitions and presentations include um, the Vancouver Art Gallery, the Polygon Gallery here in North Vancouver, um, the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto, the Sabrina Amrani Gallery in Madrid, the Museum Villa Stuck in Munich, the Institute for New Connotative Action in Seattle, um, the Saz Manab in Tehran, the Sharjah Contemporary Art Museum, uh, and the Bogosian Foundation Villa Ampang in Brussels, and Victoria, and Albert Museum in London, amongst others. Um, so welcome, Babak, and thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, and it's also a pleasure to introduce Ali. So Ali Ahadi um, was born in Tehran, Iran in 1984. And he is an Iranian Canadian artist and writer based in Vancouver, grounded in the intersectionalities of aesthetics of contingency, ontological analysis of language and politics of subjectivization. His interdisciplinary practice spans from site-specific uh, site installation to sculpture, photo and video-based works, writing and translation. Consisting of representational images, videos, composite objects and texts that propose certain ways for approaching conceptual dualities, Ahadi's work is constituted through addressing the problems of presentation and representation monsteration and demonstration and the relationships between aesthetics and contingent forms of abstract abstraction that are irreducible to the conventional artistic determination. And Ahadi is an internationally exhibited artist. His last solo exhibition, Shit Yes Academy, Go Ballet Academy, was held at the Egg Gallery of Tehran in Iran. 
And in 2012, he received his MFA in visual arts from the University of British Columbia, where he is currently a visual art educator and a PhD candidate in the interdisciplinary studies with a central focus on continental philosophy and visual arts. And so Ali and Babak um, have come together to form the artistic group Alibaba Conundrum, and Alibaba Conundrum's first solo exhibition will be held at Griffin Art Projects in September of 2022. And Babak and Ali have been in residence at Griffin Art Projects uh, throughout the months of June and July 2021, and so we're just super excited to hear um, from both of you today and to have a chance to learn more about your process, um, your projects, and what you've been up to in the studio. So thank you so much, uh, Ali and Babak, and I'll pass it right over to you. Thank you so much, Yas, for that thorough introduction. And uh, I'm sorry about my worthy bio. <laughs> so uh, let me share the uh, presentation today. Uh, I mean, our keynote. Uh, let me know if you see it properly. So do you see the Keynote full screen? Yes, Just perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, good morning, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, Ali and I are very excited and happy to be here uh, presenting this very exciting research and project that's upcoming uh, from the Griffin Art Project. Uh, before we jump into it, we would like to uh, thank uh, Griffin Arts Project uh, uh, Director Lisa Valdesera for uh, having a very engaged conversation with us throughout uh, the past few months and, and, and prior to that. Uh, Jazz as well as uh, Brittany who has been who've been uh, supporting us uh, in different ways with our residency. Um, we would uh, like to uh, give a little bit of a background on, on the uh, notion of our uh, duo, uh, as well as uh, breaking down uh, uh, the term that we have named ourselves um, and uh, the research that we've been doing. Um, so uh, how did we come up with this uh, title for ourselves, Alibaba Conundrum? Um, Ali and I have been working together uh, for the past, well, we've known each other for, for quite a few years, over a decade now. And uh, throughout the years, we've collaborated in different ways. We've uh, uh, constantly been each other's soundboards on our projects and research. Uh, we've uh, uh, had um, interviews published. Uh, we've had uh, talks and discussions and panels that we've part participated in. And it kind of became a logical uh, step to take to form a duo and uh, um, rely on the crossovers between our um, practices, not so much the materiality of our practice, but um, the common grounds in the intellectual organization of um, our practice. Um, and the, the sort of some of the things that we can point to is uh, language uh, as, as a common ground that we've been focusing on, both of us, um, and other things such as propaganda, politics of uh, uh, seeing, uh, it's been important for both of us, political economy as well as propaganda and uh, lately cyber cybernetics, um, which play in both of our practices, um, their underlying uh, structures of our practices. Um, and in terms of the residency, we've, we've, since we've never been uh, working together, we've never had a residency together, uh, we kind of uh, wanted to come up with a framework uh, in terms of how we are going to approach the residency. So it was also very logical for us to approach it as a research residency, research that is towards uh, this exhibition that Jazz mentioned, which we're very excited to, um, to be um, producing for Griffin Arts Project next year in September. Um, and we needed a sort of a methodology uh, to, to uh, structure the um, uh, residency and since we are very much about you know discussion and communication we thought uh, verbal polemic and argumentation would be a good framework uh, to move this residency forward uh, and language became our primary um, operational material so we focused on that basically sat in this room empty for uh, for days and weeks um, 
had talked a lot. And what was important uh, in so doing uh, was to come up with these uh, argumentations uh, uh, and contingencies um, that occurred as, as we were talking. So every time we talked about something, ideas and, and uh, problems and uh, sometimes conundrums would, would pop up and then we would take it somewhere. Uh, they would happen quite consistently and serendipitously. Um, and we were so happy that this, this was uh, going on throughout the whole, it, it's still happening. And we would sketch ideas out uh, towards projects. Sometimes we would keep them, sometimes we would just toss them out. Uh, but it, it is resulting in a very productive and uh, exciting uh, way for us. Um, and it's also setting out the general framework for our exhibition, uh, which is important. So while we're not producing uh, necessarily any objects, we're uh, very getting very close to being clear in terms of what the exhibition would look like and how the structure of it would be. Um, also something that uh, is quite new for us. Um, but before talking about the, 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 the more about the framework of, of the exhibition, I think we would like to share parts of uh, our thinking process. Uh, and Ali, maybe you can uh, sure. sort of begin by doing that. Sure, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Thanks, Bobak. Yeah. As Bobak said, like, basically the residency so far uh, has been a research residency. And today, much of what you're going to, to see from us is uh, basically disclosing or opening the door towards our uh, research process and thinking process. And, and as Bobak said, <clears throat> this uh, form that uh, our uh, studio practice during this uh, collective or dual residency uh, took basically this polemic argumentation that Bobak was talking about. I think it's quite important in the sense that uh, it wasn't like that Bobak and I disagreed on things that we needed to argue in order to convince one another. But also, on the contrary, we had this theoretical uh, uh, formula that thought can only grasp new ideas in the form of the synthesis that would rise out of like verbal argumentation. So in the sense, Alibaba Kananmanos practice, one might say that, oh, it's pretty conceptual in the sense of like, conceptual art as the genre of concept. I would, I would disagree and say, no, it's really material-based art practice with the only difference that the very operational material here, instead of being plaster or wood or nail or et cetera, it is the very physicality uh, of language, the sound and like uh, slippages. So theoretically be held fast to this notion that yeah, as long as we talk, the more we talk, uh, the higher our chances that uh, the contingent happenings would occur. And then it was our role as artists uh, to either incorporate those uh, accidents or to just like simply like, you know, expound them and you know, push them inside. But before, as Bobak said, uh, I'd like to uh, share parts of like the general orientation of uh, Ali Baba Kunan Rome's uh, world, basically. Uh, the situation for Ali Baba Kunan Rome is like, uh, Basically, Ali Baba Kunan comes to grips with these circumstances in which you can imagine, uh, as I'm sure it's, it's been the case with so many of you, uh, imagine one is about to looking up online a Jean-Luc Godard's movie, uh, but uh, one instead uh, ends up buying a backpack. And uh, so that situation for us uh, is, the, is, is the primary uh, question that what about the situation that, uh, uh, and what happens exactly to us when, we, when we're spending the like, vast majority of our time in that uh, spatio-temporality of the online and digital interfaces. And we basically get drifted and navigated uh, by the algorithm of this uh, online socioeconomic sphere. So uh, during the uh, end of 60s, with the rise of uh, different forms of uh, socially engaged art practices, such as uh, I mean, earlier on, let the letters internationals, and then later towards the end of the 60s, with the situation is international, fluxes, uh, or the so called program of end of uh, images, uh, which was basically more inclined to bring together the notion of life and art and get rid of the uh, like platonic separability between the two. Uh, so during the end of the 60s, with these art movements, uh, 
tactics such as uh, artistic tactics, subversive tactics such as uh, the SI and situations tactics such as like psychogeography, derive, uh, detournement, uh, were basically uh, being uh, advocated as anti spectacle uh, uh, strategies, uh, methodologies. Regardless of how successful these uh, movements were, uh, today I think the question that we're dealing with is that like, we're absolutely dealing with an absolute incorporation or recuperation, to use Giddy Board's own, uh, own terminology, of the very notion of derive uh, into the very design of the socioeconomic uh, online sphere. So uh, to, the, to, the, to the extent that to be an online user today is a tantamount uh, to algorithmically get drifted around uh, into somewhere that uh, you would encounter things. So if we take derive, I'm just reading it from uh, the, the, the situation's pamphlet that in a derive, one or more person during a certain period drop their usual motives uh, for moments and action, their relations, their work and leisure activities, and let themselves be drawn by the attractions of the train and encounters they find there. But the derive includes both this letting go and its necessary contradiction. The domination of psychogeographical variations by the knowledge and calculations of possibilities. So if this was, by the end of 60s, uh, an anti-spectacle, an anti-authoritarian, or being basically the method to help one to get off the grid, today, just sitting by our computer, like you know, clicking on the browser, the very design and the algorithmic structure of uh, of the online world, which is the contemporary world for us, is basically designed based on the incorporation of theory. So, and the question of Alibaba conundrum is that like, so what is to be done today? Like, not to derive is to derive mm -hmm. uh, in the contemporary situation. So, uh, with that sense, basically Alibaba conundrum uh, has a side view to the online, uh, uh, online cybernetic uh, domain, and on the other hand, to the uh, notion of uh, language. Uh, I can go on and uh, talk briefly about, uh, a bit more specifically about uh, uh, the intellectual organization of Alibaba Conundrum, uh, but, but, but later on we'll get back to what about Alibaba and what about Conundrum. Uh, well, as you can see on the screen, like uh, Alibaba Conundrum signals our interest uh, in questions surrounding and the contemporary modes of representation, both in art and non-art, in, in the specific political economy, information dissemination, and the machinic connection between the symbolic and the imaginary that is enforced through the digital sphere and media. The term Alibaba may come to signify two seemingly disparate subjects, the first of which, of course, uh, is the orientalized, and not the orientalizing, the orientalized uh, story of uh, uh, Alibaba and the 45th of Baghdad inserted actually by an Orientalist, Antoine Galland, into a thousand night, uh, into a thousand and one night. Uh, so the story did not really belong to that uh, edition. So the French edition of the uh, thousand and one night, uh, once it was, uh, it was published, Antoine Galland, who had heard this story from another third party, he inserted it in that. And later on, we all got to know Alibaba basically as I mean, based on these uh, editions, and I personally myself got to know Alibaba through uh, Walt Disney. But anyway, the, and the second signification of Alibaba, the concomitant contemporary signification of it is uh, Alibaba.com, most specifically for people living in North America, which is a contemporary or like an equivalent for Amazon, for example. Uh, and it's not forced to mention that we are, or the Alibaba conundrum is more inclined toward this second signification of the term Alibaba rather than the identitarian uh, meaning of uh, or whatever signification that might uh, might be the case with the term Alibaba. Uh, so we, we think that the digital interface and this algorithmic logic of such platforms like Amazon, Alibaba.com, uh, condition uh, contemporary citizens' desire for seeing, resulting in a linguistic automatism. So basically a language that is working and operating on its own, which that linguistic automatism facilitates the consumption through that thing. So it's quite complex yet simple uh, uh, mechanism. So there is all this like, you know, visible interfaces through the digital sphere that basically uh, 
uh, for a manufacturer how to desire things. Uh, and that desiring uh, creates a linguistic automatism, a language that is like mostly unilateral, so from media to us. And that language, and uh, together with that, like uh, manufactured desire could facilitate uh, the contemporary mode of consuming, basically. Uh, the other uh, aspects of Alibaba conundrum, which is the linguistic aspect. So, and it's kind of different with the linguistic term that was being the case with the post structuralism. We think that notwithstanding in what language one is born, whether you're speaking Farsi, Arabic, English, whatever, uh, and regardless of uh, the very box of one's living, whether you're living in like, South of Africa or here in Vancouver, uh, we think that English language is globally conditioning through cybernetic machine and the media propaganda industry and the possibilities of thought today. I mean, if I may to unpack this, it, I, can, I can put this in this way, that you either speak English today or you want to speak English proper. You are either an English speaking person or you're being defined negatively as a non-speaking English, non -English speaking person. So uh, the, the, we, can, we can unpack this in, 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 within, the, uh, within the context of the relationship with the other. And so and I think it's quite important, and I don't want to really get into the details of it, but so in a way, uh, this would give us a different angle to the question of uh, uh, identity, b b b because uh, with, the, uh, with this relationship to the other, instead of, uh, as it's usually and typically the case with the majority of the identitarian uh, practices, instead of regarding the other as a pure exteriority, uh, Alibaba Conangrum does regard the other as an internal constitutive of our subjectivity. So in a way, uh, we're as English speaking subjects, as the English speaking subject is Farsi speaking subject or Arabic speaking subject. The question is just that like very uh, famous uh, Hegelian uh, struggle for recognition, the master slave or Lord Bondsman dialectic. So the English speaking word does not really need to recognize the non-English non speaking word as much as uh, is the case for the reverse of it. But anyway, so Alibaba Conundrum is trying to use the similar subversive strategies that is the case with this unilateral language usage in the online sphere uh, and implement that by this visual commodity bazaar such as Alibaba.com uh, to research and propose ways of questioning this manufacturing of desire uh, through subversive art practice. So, uh, but, but I think we can we can talk a bit about like uh, this was the Alibaba. Now we can maybe you talk, want to talk about the Yeah, uh, we from the get go, uh, the the notion of conundrum was very um, attractive to us, and we were very keen on. But this is a good example of how uh, contingency of our uh, discussions would take us to a place that was a very very happy place, but also very surprising place. So the, our immediate response was conundrum sounds Latin, so let's look at it and uh, look at the etymology. And we quickly realized that uh, that was a false understanding of it. Um, the, the word conundrum sounds uh, Latin, but it's actually manufactured by um, uh, a few Oxford students in the 17th century who uh, kind of had this uh, position towards a very particular prof who was um, uh, describing uh, the word conundrum very well, like uh, someone who was quite uptight, quite uh, um, fussy. And, yeah, and, and, and they, they really wanted to kind of uh, cr create a word that uh, is ascribed to this person. And then the rest is history, which is, which is super interesting. Um, but Conundrum, as we understand it, uh, sort of, it, um, it, 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 is, it is a difficult situation. It's a challenge that doesn't have a resolute answer. It's uh, possibly uh, answered by a riddle in which odd resemblances um, is proposed between things that quite, are quite unlike. So bringing two things that don't necessarily uh, make immediate sense. Uh, and that was also very interesting for us in terms of our strategy of, of production. Um, and of course, a notorious uh, art history figure who uh, has 
who worked with language quite a bit and, and puns and uh, uh, riddles are part of his, was part, were part of his practice is Marcel Duchamp. Uh, one, of, one of the works that he had done, which uh, we think is quite uh, uh, important and significant piece is the book, uh, Marchand du Sel, which uh, loosely translates as the merchant of uh, salt or salt cellar, as it's been translated in English. Uh, and it's not, there's no significant uh, uh, significance to, to the, to the uh, titling of this book, other than him rearranging the letters of his own name, as you can see in the cover of the book, uh, to come up with, the, with, with this pun, essentially. And studying the book, we came across this um, equation that he had invented, uh, which you can see, uh, art to art, uh, art is to art, as shit to shit. So we, <laughs> um, we kind of took this as, um, as one of our departure points and uh, uh, sketched out a piece which we're working on towards uh, our, our exhibition. <laughs> Sunday open studio, <laughs> um, um, but we should probably dig in a little bit more into the lang language and linguistic sure. framework that we're, we've been talking about and uh, theorizing a little bit. So I'll pass it to you. Yeah, but before doing so, uh, I mean, the, the slide that you're seeing, this equation uh, of uh, the Alibaba conundrum, I mean, our hands are kind of quite tight because the exhibition that we're having uh, next September, it's basically operating on a narrative base and like you no know, each work is uh, basically having this relationship to the to the other work in the exhibition and we cannot really quite like i don't know, spoil it <laughs> so uh, this what you see here uh, uh, that may have some significations or no signification whatsoever uh, at this particular moment uh, is kind of like encapsulating uh, the general uh, uh, beautiful and at the same time, the theological uh, uh, framework. And the angle that we're looking at. And the angle that or we're looking at uh, of yeah. the exhibition. So uh, let's leave this for here. Like, keep it in mind. And uh, <laughs> next year, uh, hopefully, this will have more sense. Now, as Bob like said, uh, getting back to uh, our, uh, what, what's the specific approach that uh, Alibaba Conundrum has to the notion of language? Because Again, the moment we talk about language, uh, one who's uh, artistically institutionalized enough uh, would immediately think of that, oh, conceptual art and like, you know, uh, post-structuralism and post-modern. Uh, as far as the Alibaba conundrum is concerned, I'd, I'd like to take the opportunity to say that there is nothing post-modern about uh, the Alibaba conundrum. I mean, if you take the, uh, the very axiom of post-modernism as like their only languages and bodies, cultural differences, sexual differences, and so on and so forth. Alibaba is exactly defining itself as the negative generic side of uh, singularities rather than particularities. But there is something quite important uh, about uh, uh, taking the lead from that point that we set up in terms of the significance of the English language mm -hmm. as the language of the hegemon. And, and the, as the language of the king, unquote, uh, basically, uh, there is something really specific about we approach the question of English. By the we, I mean like the the non the non English speaking people. And I don't really regard this as an identity. I just regard this as a as a condition. Uh, so I, I'd like to unpack this a little bit. 
we usually learn our mother tongue uh, in an indexical manner. So uh, in the sense that, uh, I mean, linguistics, uh, linguists would say that we learn the mother tongue in an indexical manner in the sense that the mother is usually and simultaneously enunciating the term uh, and at the same time pointing to the reference mm -hmm. when talking to the toddler, that, like, don't touch that cop, don't touch it. So, and the toddler assumes in an implicit manner that what is being enunciated should be the one and the same thing with what is being pointed at. And through this uh, course of implications, you assume and you learn the language. When you come to the learning of the second language, uh, or basically when you come to English language, from a different language that you've been dwelling in, uh, the situation is quite quite the reverse. Uh, so if we take the first uh, method or mode of learning language maternal, uh, I would say that the uh, second way of the learning language as a second language is quite paternal. So we can call this a father tongue. And uh, so in which uh, we don't have that implications anymore because there is no mother's body. We're dealing with an absolute abstraction, mm -hmm. which is an abstraction is an absence. And that absence is the absence of the mother. Uh, there nobody points to the referent to the world out there. And all we need to do is just like go into the father that dictionary is. So, and through the father, we will learn the, the word and the, uh, and the signs and the signifiers. What happens here is quite fascinating because we have a gap between the time that we learn the word and the time that the word comes to signification, mm -hmm. so which is like before we, we go to the dictionary, we have this free absolute opportunity of imagination that what would that word signify? And there's a great space for linguistic errors or Freudian slippages and so on and so forth. In that sense, the non-English speaking person is quite privileged mm -hmm. compared to the first, uh, to, to the person English born, was born in that language. And because for the non-English non speaking person, the words and the signifiers are basically sounds. They're sonic signifiers. So we haven't embodied them. So, and there is this absolute uh, gap in which we can get on a creative act. Mm -hmm. And so uh, let's call the first one indexical. Uh, uh, I mean, by the index and the symbolic, I'm getting a bit of structural is here, but like uh, just for sake of this conversation, uh, and let's call this uh, non-English speaking way of learning English the symbolic. Uh, so, uh, and it, and by the way, I'm sorry for all these images that you saw. Uh, we're just getting drifted around uh, algorithmically. And uh, when I was like putting together this presentation with Bob, like we were just randomly googling these uh, words and. Uh, this is how internet looks like today. So if there is anything wrong with those images, that simply reveals the consciousness of the internet today and the, uh, and the socioeconomic digital sphere that we're dealing with. But we learn this very fantastically from psychoanalysis that it is always in the context with the, in the, context with the father, with the symbolic, with the state that the real or the re revolution could take place. So it is in this sense that we really like to uh, to come to grips and to kind of wrestle away with uh, with uh, with the English language uh, as a, as a protocol of abstraction, uh, I can I can talk a little bit about uh, uh, because uh, the first question coming to head is that uh, what just, what just about before sure. you do that because we've we've uh, done an interview uh, together on protocols of abstraction and uh, um, how. Um, it, Ali has uh, theorized it, so maybe we could refer to that as well at the end. Um, sure. And maybe touch on this a little bit because I'm I'm a little bit conscious of the time as well. Sure. Uh, and we we um, maybe touch on it and then we we move on and yeah, yeah. provide the sure provide the uh, yeah for sure. Uh, the first question coming to head, I think, is uh, what about abstractions? Mm -hmm. Every artist is basically today making abstract art, and the first thing coming to head with abstract art is something that is visually abstract mm -hmm. and visually not recognizable, which I <laughs> say the bully to the eye. So because uh, if abstraction is supposed to be an absence from the status quo, that visual abstraction in and of itself is quite of a doxa, is quite of the common case of the 
um, artwork situation. So in a way, we're used to and accustomed to walking into the art spaces and see things that are visually not necessarily making sense. So that in and of itself is a solidified language rather than an abstract language. For us, I mean, by us, I mean, again, uh, the Alibaba conundrum, uh, the abstraction has to take place in the relationship between the language uh, and, and, the, and, and, the, and, and the referent in the sense that this, uh, the visible economy of the object uh, needs to be constantly interrupted mm -hmm. by the linguistic economy that, for example, the title is. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that could leave the room uh, for the abstraction. Let me just quickly refer to uh, some of the very hot uh, uh, debates that is going on today on the abstraction from different philosophers like Razan Nigarastani, Alain Badio, and so on and so forth. For example, Nigarastani says that abstraction is the ambition of thought um, to liberate itself from the tyranny, from the oppressiveness of the here and now. Mm -hmm. And I think in so far, as, in, as far as Alibaba Conundrum is concerned, uh, that's quite wrong because uh, yes, abstraction must be a return to the here and now because what we call here and now is a, in and of itself, the constant referencing to language mm -hmm. that is there and then, that is the category of the already said, things that have been spoken already, things that have been defined for us, that unilateral relationship between language, that is the case, for example, with the cybernetics. So this is uh, the general methodology of the Alibaba Conundrum. So if, if you take the strategy as polemical argumentations, talking about art, uh, and, and because those who are not really onto the, uh, on keen on the notion of the discursive argumentation, they say, oh, art is not to make one think necessarily. Art is to produce sensation, sure. We recall that the sensory alibi, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but even in order to explain the very mechanism of those sensations, all you need to, all, all you have in your hands is just to get in on this like, discursive argumentations about why do I feel the way I feel? Uh, so uh, with that, uh, we, can, we can just briefly name some of, uh, uh, some of the uh, tactics for creating this type of abstractions. So one of them is neologism, basically like uh, creating uh, non-existing words. Uh, I'm just going to read this briefly and quickly uh, from the screen. Uh, we know that the relationship between language and discourse uh, is not a primordial, but foundational in the sense that language is based on the discourse. There is something, there is a discourse and then the language, uh, so in, in, in the way that language is a discourse that is voiced. Uh, so uh, Consequently, it is because of the latter uh, that language posits the existence of an element within discourse, especially when discourse is thought of as the articulation of intelligibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, neologism, quite the reverse, are not to be viewed as a form or a function of naming. Their functionality is not to allocate new terms to things that already exist in discourse. Mm -hmm. So, neologism is not really uh, calling an uh, alley. David, so uh, uh, is, is basically the, it doesn't do that so things would gain yet another chance to so to be better understood from the subject's point of view. What is at work with the mechanism of neologism is indeed the reversal of this explained relationship between language and discourse. Mm -hmm. uh, neologisms implant within language new signifiers whose signifiers are yet to be constructed within discourse. So in a way it's a monstration. Mm -hmm. uh, in this sense, neologisms are only to be conceived of as function of thought acts in so far as they concern not things that already are, but rather those that are not yet. In short, neologism is an effort to facilitate the transmutation of that which is not mm -hmm. into beings. And it is in this way that however provisionally they induce transformation um, within the world. Another uh, term is paralogism. Paralogism is quite similar to Kanan. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it has a lot to do with simply defining it, parallelism is illogical use of logic. Uh, so uh, they can be divided into different sets of verbal and conceptual parallelisms. The former deals with the relations uh, with the, between the signifiers, whereas the latter centers on the relations among the signifier. There also exists another type of parallelism, which one would call VT parallelism. They engage a form of fallacious deduction touching upon the relationships between homophonic signifiers and 
uh, humorous phrases. So for example, that equation that Duchamp had created mm -hmm. in and of itself is a paralogistic par act, like that uh, ah is to ah and equals like shit to shit. Shit could be like a person with a different accent saying that, oh shit, man, shit. So, <laughs> so it is illogical yet logical. So you cannot read the, it is in this yeah. sense that it is a conundrum. Yeah. Because you cannot win the argument. So uh, one can say, no, it's shit. And, and the other said, no, it's shit. And, and so anyway, so the panologisms are creating paradoxes. And this is quite important. Alibaba conundrum is obsessed with creating paradoxes. If you take doxa uh, as uh, common sense, the public opinion, as that which goes without saying, uh, Paradoxes is paradoxa, uh, that which kind of like breaks this chain of signification, it is that which does not make sense. So it is in this sense that Ali Baba Conundrum is really uh, going to uh, operate on this uh, a priori expectations of the audience that would have from the term Ali Baba. They, come, they would come to Alibaba and oh yeah, Alibaba, Baba and Ali are, yeah, they're, they're in a way Alibaba. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but they would ideally get in to see an Alibaba that is a generic floating signifier. We're treating Alibaba as a floating signifier. Ali, Alibaba does not have a body. Alibaba no, does not have a flesh, but only a grammar. So in a way, Alibaba, it is a verb uh, in so far as it is an act. The act of it is creating paradoxes. So with this, we can perhaps refer to the title of this <laughs> talk today, that what is to be, what is to be Alibaba. Uh, so uh, just to build upon this, uh, uh, and I'm going to wrap it up on this, uh, this uh, relationships between uh, neologism and paralogisms and discourse, the symbolic discourse, the state, uh, and that state could be whatever, the state of art institutions, the state of like economic, social, political, economic states, uh, we know that uh, the relationships in linguistics, the relationship between the signified and the signifiers are absolutely arbitrary. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that Alibaba is called Alibaba and is not called uh, Robinson Crusoe is an absolute contingency. Yeah. There's no logic whatsoever behind it. So <laughs> in this sense, like let's take, I don't know, I, this is a slide that we're going to perhaps uh, end uh, today's presentation uh, with. Uh, that if you take a sign uh, as, a, as a constructed uh, duality or dual relationship between the signified, the sound image and the concept, uh, in the case of a frog, uh, uh, this is a type of frog that uh, the Alibaba uh, conundrum would, uh, would like to uh, basically come up with. Uh, and again, this is another image that uh, we found online. And, uh, Googling what? Yeah, yeah, it's really important to know that uh, we're not just making things up. I found this image by putting in, in, in the Google the word random things, random things. And this is the first random thing that comes up uh, searching the word random things. Uh, so and this is how the uh, language of the internet is working today. So I think that's pretty much it uh, for uh, uh, this part of it. And I think we can we can open it up to the Q and A. Yeah, I think it would be it would be exciting to hear some questions and comments. Thanks, Ali. Oh, thank you. <laughs> awesome! Thank you so much, Babak and Ali. Uh, so much to think about, and yeah, just so amazing to get kind of a peek into your process and kind of the things you've been researching and and talking about at the studio. Um, so, as I mentioned, I was the, the first question, I'm just running to the washroom and I'll be quickly back. Another conundrum. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, as I mentioned at the beginning, feel free to type your questions into the Q&A dialogue box um, and I can read them out to Babak and Ali or uh, it's always kind of nice to hear from audience members directly. So if you have a question and would like to ask it out loud, um, you can raise a virtual hand or just type in the Q&A that you'd like to be unmuted. Um, and I'm very happy to do so. And we'll just give um, Ali a moment to get back with us too.
My apologies. No problem. <laughs> Thank you, Adi, for, uh, for that comment. Thank you. Yeah, maybe while, while we're just waiting um, for questions to come in too, I just thought it was so amazing to hear kind of you talk at the very beginning of your presentation about um, kind of the working together for the first time as an artistic uh, collective and how that kind of just took the form as I think you said augmented our argumentation, our intense argumentation, kind of just like that back and forth in the studio. Um, it actually, I don't know if either of you tuned into Worldings last week, but it reminded me a lot of um, one of our panels with the Center for the Less Good Idea, um, which was titled The Collapse, Creative Liberation of Collective Making and kind of just being in that space of collective making and kind of letting go of more structured or rigid ways of working. And I wondered if you found that working together, um, how that affected your process and if it opened up new directions that neither of you would have thought would come up going into it. Absolutely, I think that was part of the excitement. And of course, there's a little bit of anxiety happening with that because you build something and you're kind of opening it up to other possibilities. And that was, I think from the get go, we kind of put it as an agreement that we want to have fun. Um, we want to make something that makes us happy in terms of when we're looking at it, it would give us joy. And that we would stay true to, to the core of our practices and, and the theories that we're very much engaged with. Um, and it has, it has kind of come to fruition in a way that all of those, I mean, we, we still have kind of moments of anxiety and, and uh, uh, a little bit of uncertainties, but that is also a sign and a signal for us that we should let that go. We should let that part that's giving us anxiety go. That's not the right thing for us. So in that sense, it's been, it's been very interesting. Um, and, and also, the, I mean, the whole notion of collaboration, it's, um, it's proving uh, to be much more productive in a way um, because we're holding each other accountable to like, we have a particular schedule that we're holding on to um, and we have a very clear structure. Like the first day that we sat here, we came up with a structure. And uh, uh, it, it's, so in, in that sense, it's been, it's been very productive. Um, you want to introduce? Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have much to add to that. Uh, is the, the the question is the one that we're seeing on the chat? Is this? Uh, it's the one that um, Jazz asked. But yeah, those are th that's the next question. Yeah, but the Griffin Art Projects is asking us <laughs> that. Can you that's tell us? Lisa probably. Uh, that's Lisa probably. That uh, how this process is informing the architecture of the exhibition that we're planning. Uh, I think I can just build upon what Bobak said by adding that uh, this, uh, let's call this contingent art practice, and I'm quoting from uh, Robin McKay, uh, that a contingent artist is the artist who has embraced the thought of contingency into his own material practice. By that, that like we believe, we agree that we shoot hands that like, regardless of where we're coming from and what are the doxa and the solidified structures informed by the institutions expectations that we each individually had in our practice, it is only through the course of like the uh, dialectical clashes between these two artistic egos that uh, the synthesis would be, uh, would be something that could be an interesting object to be reflected upon. And in the sense that how would this inform the architecture of the exhibitions. That is what the necessity of theory for us is. We need to have a theoretical formula, otherwise we would end up in the middle of nowhere. And that formula is that we have a general framework. That general framework is political economy, politics of seeing, and politics of subjectivization with regard to the question of English. And staying as away as possible from the realm of particularities and uh, uh, institutional expectations that are normative art practices, such as like, uh, I don't know, cultural practices and so on and so forth. So that is the formula. As long as these contingencies are occurring, 
if they're totally off the track from the questions of desire, politics, political economy, we just expound it. Once they're related, we put it in. But every individual object that we, we make uh, as a result of this polemical argumentation, they bring with themselves their own semantic load. So they demand another word to be made in relation to them. So it is in this word that look at turtle. So we take step by step from one, one word to the other and we, just, we, we make a critical distance every now and often to see that where are we going with. So uh, for example, that slide, that equation that you saw in today's presentation, that itself was the result of another object. And simultaneously that equation demanded another word that we need, we have to make. So in, in the sense, Alibaba conundrum, the exhibition, I mean, is an installation. Uh, so there is no such a thing as constellation of individual objects that we just put together and uh, they, they, they be curated together. And no, they all uh, uh, relate to one another and you cannot really uh, subtract one from the totality and uh, to give it a meaning, to abstract it out. I think, I'm not sure if I answered that question. No, I, I think um, something to add to that, uh, which is important is that we, from the get go, we wanted to structure the whole exhibition around the short film. So we are planning uh, on, on producing a, a short film um, that the, 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 some of the objects would be part of the film. Some of the objects are drawn from the film. So it's a constellation of things. And I, I think um, what you may, uh, sort of wanted to say is that it is highly curated, in fact, not, not um, it, it would be highly curated in, in conversation with, uh, with Lisa. But, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just meant not, not, in, not in the typical sense of the curating individual, individual objects. objects. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's the constellation that would be um, uh, curated and, and create that, uh, that sort of uh, effect or mm -hmm. uh, get a sense of the act that we want. So hopefully that uh, answers that question. I see some questions. Is there more? Yeah. Oh, I was just questions. gonna say, I, I can read these. We have a few waiting for us in the Q&A um, and I'll just go ahead and I'll read them out loud for you so everyone can hear. Um, our first question, were the images you showed of hands at the beginning work you have produced or are they reference points for your work? Uh, you wanna answer that? Go ahead. Oh, well, and hi, Keith, by the way, yeah, long time. <laughs> uh, if, if, if what you mean are those... Uh, yeah, the, the hands and, and uh, the two that are holding. The, the yes, yeah, 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 those, those, those are uh, the very, very preliminary sketches of, uh, of uh, some objects that we were making throughout uh, the, uh, the, the thinking process. So yes, they're made by us, uh, but... Uh, uh, they do have reference points too. Like we, 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 we watch a lot of films. Obviously we have this great room. We have an amazing projector here and we just watch films. Um, and then there is a moment that we pause and then that's the moment. Like we, we forget about the film. We start uh, sketching things out and those um, come out of that. You can see one behind us as well. Um, uh, yeah, so that, in a way the answer is both. They are sketches, they are potential works, and they are uh, uh, referential based on another reference. So that's that's what I would Yeah, for example, this work that is behind us without giving too much away from it. It's called uh, The Origin of the World, uh, taking the lead from uh, Corbet. Corbet. Uh, the image itself is referencing to uh, a film but that referencing for us is not as important as what we made with this image and the way we titled the version of the word, what that opened up uh, for us. And this was, for example, a very key object uh, that, okay, if this is the origin of the world, where do we need to go from here? And from here, we took the lead and we ended up some more interesting, such as that slide that we saw um, with the Schubert's Ave Maria uh, being played on it. Thank you. Um, so I'll read out our next question. When you work with language, the audience would be restricted. 
Um, and so this uh, audience member is wondering if this body of work that you guys are creating would be for English language audience or would it have some other ways of communication for others as well? Sure. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that's a really important question. Uh, I believe that there are at least three to four different uh, custom and typical way of art making, one of which is the exhibition. The other one is studio visits. The other one is open studio. So the modality of art making in a studio visit and open the studio that we just had today. I think it's not necessarily one and the same thing, but what one would come up to and have an encounter with in the exhibition. So I would say the exhibition would not really necessarily be specifically linguistically oriented in the sense that if you do not have an equal access to that language, you would not really get as much as someone else's would get from that exhibition away from it. This is the very individual and singular artistic relationship between the artist and the material. Uh, at the same time, uh, given that very initial axiom that we, we came up with to, towards the question of English language, in a way, uh, I, I have a friend uh, who told me once before that I was talking about America and, and he said, oh, you're American. I was like, no, dude, I'm Iranian. And then we had an interesting conversation and I realized that yes, today we're all American in a super problematic way, by the way. Uh, so, uh, because I'm simply negatively defined by being under the effects and affects of, uh, of the so-called America. So in this sense, the show is for English speaking people and non-English speaking people. Uh, but the exhibition itself, if that's what the question is really asking for, would not really be linguistically specific. Uh, this is the modality of talking about the uh, basically behind the scene. Uh, and it's not the same thing with the exhibition. Thank you. Thank you, Pega, for that question. So perhaps we'll, we'll let just a few minutes, if anyone has a question they wanna get in, or if you'd like to ask your question out loud, feel free to um, just click that yellow virtual hand button at the bottom of your screen. Um, but in the meantime, maybe I'll just uh, jump on to just again, say thank you so much for your time today and for, for allowing that kind of preview into the exhibition that you're working on. Um, and we hope for those audience members that are joining from the Vancouver region or from BC that you'll be able to make it out in 2022 for the actual exhibition. But um, we're, we're all looking forward to following along and, and seeing the, the project develop. So yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Iranian dudes and uh, friends and uh, from the Tehran art scene that I see their names here. I say hi to everybody. Hopefully we can manage to, to somehow like, uh, I mean, uh, this would be something that Lisa or, uh, and us would, would talk about it more that like to have like panels and discussions around the actual exhibition so people from Tehran could be invited to it as well. That, yeah. That'd be amazing. There's so many huge brains sitting sitting on that table that I can see their names. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. All right, we have a question. Oh. Thank you, Carly. Carly, sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, thank you again, Babak and Ali. And I guess we'll wrap things up there for today, but we really appreciate um, your time and your presentation today. So thank you very so much. Thank you. Thanks for attending. And thanks everyone for joining us. Cheers.